arrive to our last plenary session for the day. It's about incentive policies for the benefit of nation. I would like to introduce uh, to moderate this session, Mr. Henry Loendahl uh, from the United Kingdom, founder and CEO of WAFTEC. Thank you very much and good afternoon everyone and thanks for coming to the final panel um, of the conference today. Um, so as mentioned, the panel is looking at the whole area of incentives, um, foreign direct investment and sustainable development and how, how we can link those together to, it, to encourage more sustainable development around the world. Um, we have an excellent panel of, as you can see it's rather large. So. <laughs> um, Hopefully you have a bit of time so we can ensure that all the panelists have, have ample time to, to share their experience and insights. Um, I think what's really interesting about our panel is that we have a whole mixture of, of uh, different organizations represented from you know, major private sector organizations to major national governments in both emerging and developed economies and multilateral organizations. So I think you know, by the end of this session we'll have a, a, a really uh, holistic view of this topic. Um, as it's the last session, I, I won't speak anymore. I think we maybe just go straight to the panelists. So um, rather than me introducing everyone, I thought it would be nice just uh, for each person, if they wouldn't mind, please just introducing yourself, uh, the organization you work for, um, and, and any relevant background you'd like to mention, you know, is absolutely fine just to talk about it now. Thank you. Do you want to start, Alistair? Afternoon, everybody. My name's Alistair Long. I'm the UK Department for International Trades Regional Director for the Middle East. Uh, that's the Gulf and, and the countries around it. But um, uh, the Department for International Trade, a new ministry for the UK, is responsible for the UK's trade and investment promotion and now also our trade policy and trade finance uh, and preparing for the UK's future outside the European <laughs> Union uh, by creating around the world the, the trade arrangements that we will need for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sapar Viktor uh, Chairman of the FDA Agency of Kazakhstan, Kazakh Invest, it's under the office of the Prime Minister. Uh, it's a uh, widely new agency, uh, mainly support to, in order to support the investment. And this is the main one-stop shop for the, all the investors in Kazakhstan. Thank you. Uh, my name's Yonu uh, Frederick Aga. I'm a Deputy Director General in the World Trade Organization. Before taking up that post, I had served as Nigeria's ambassador to the WTO from 2005 to 2013. Thank you. Hi, my name is Boštian Skala, representing WIPA, World Association Investment Promotion Agencies. Mr. Tuegbaya is one of them, one of the members, also our board member. So we are having the members from 130 countries, around 175 members. So we are trying to make a networking, advocacy policy, capacity buildings for the investment promotion agencies. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Sabine Del Umo. I'm the CEO of Siemens in Southern and Eastern Africa. And I'm based in Johannesburg. Um, Siemens is in the field of electrification, automation, and digitalization, following up the mega trends which are part of society. And we are invested in Africa since more than 160 years. Hi, my name is uh, Robert Herman. I'm CEO of, CEO of Germany Trade and Invest. Uh, which is the German government agency to support business uh, in Germany, so the investment promotion agency for Germany, as well as um, um, the trade promotion organization that is uh, in cooperation with the German chamber system abroad, um, the institution that supports um, German companies to internationalize out of Germany. Um, good afternoon. My name is uh, Monab Lehem. I am originally from uh, Tunisia. I'm a founding partner of Sustainable Square, a Dubai-based uh, advisory firm that focuses on practice-related sustainability, responsibility, and social impact. Th thank you. I mean, thank you very much, everyone, for your introductions. I, I think because we have such a big panel, uh, normally I would just sit in, in the middle there, but I, I can't really see anyone. So um, if it's OK, I, I'll just stand up here, and I can see uh, everyone's reactions if they want to, to, to say anything. So we have, we have a bit of time to, to, to go through some questions. but. After each person has responded to the, the few questions I have, if, if any of you want to make any comments on those questions, please just you know, indicate to me and then you can provide any comments you would, you would like to make so we can make it more of an interactive discussion. That's okay? So, just in terms of how to proceed, I, I thought it would be interesting to look at 
um, incentives, FDI, sustainable investment from the corporate perspective, first of all, because in the end, the private sector has to drive you know, investments around the world. So I think you know, when we're talking about it, we need to you know, look at the private sector perspective first. So um, Sabine, if you, would, if you wouldn't mind you know, kicking off. So uh, um, as you mentioned, you're CEO of Siemens in, in uh, Africa, East Africa region, if I understood, heard correct, correctly. Um, so I had a, a few questions. So um, first of all, in terms of Siemens, of course, a, a huge global company, um, what does Siemens do to, to uh, support sustainable development? And when Siemens is deciding where to invest around the world, and I guess especially in Africa, um, are financial incentives relevant for your investments, um, in, in particular in terms of making more sustainable investments in different countries? All right. So maybe to the, to the first question. So when we look at sustainable development, um, so what we always will look at is uh, partnering with, with companies and with governments. And um, we currently have embarked on a few partnerships, uh, like for instance in Nigeria, um, there with, with local government, because at the end of the day, um, in, in the African environment, what you do need, you need to have the local knowledge on the ground and understanding really what is required because what looks like a good proposition from a German point of view doesn't look necessarily a good proposition to an African. And um, when I talk about African, it's also quite different in the individual countries because there are 54 thereof. And um, you cannot say, well, Nigeria is in West Africa and therefore that will fit for all the countries there. So it's quite unique. Um, we have done a, a similar cooperation um, with uh, Uganda we have signed the memorandum of understanding really trying to not only put our products in the market surely I mean it, eventually we do want to do business yeah we're not a charity we are in, in business for making profits uh, that's to the PPP question earlier um, but we do want to see that we work around society, really having a strong impact on capacity building uh, on the educational side, but also with regards to technology, because if you didn't have a certain technology, how would you know what would be the right one? So uh, that is very much our, our assistance. And um, like we have many countries like Sudan, um, where we went proactively early in before uh, the sanctions have been lifted to that extent with the possibilities we had. And I can just tell you, it, it creates wonderful relationships. Um, when we come to the later point, um, specifically around what does it make us to invest into certain countries, it is also for us very much, yeah, there are incentives, but I can tell you tax incentives are not the ones which are driving the investment for us, because the way and how we run our multinational operations, they are basically run on, on divisional level, so taxes are somewhere below, so we don't see really the benefit out of the taxes into the, the business directly. So hence, that is not necessarily our, our way to go, but incentives like we have them, for instance, uh, on the South African side, on the training side, um, where the South African government for that purpose assists basically um, with uh, the funding of training activities. And I want to give you an example. In South Africa, we have uh, uh, training institutions which you have to pay in 1% of your payroll, so everybody has to do that who is active in the country. And um, if you basically have a training scheme like a vocational training, um, and, and it basically uh, qualifies to certain standards, then you are able basically to claim the whole effort you have uh, back and you just have a timing difference for that period. And these are the things which really help us to make it a lucrative business. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, that was, that was really interesting. Um, any other panelists have any, any comments on that? No? Okay. Um, the, I mean, I think what's interesting, if I understand from what you said, is that um, Siemens has a strong commitment to sustainable development in the countries. You're doing lots of different initiatives when you invest in, in, in countries which are, I guess, tailored to the needs of each of those countries. Um, and the South Africa example was quite interesting. And if I understood, you, you said that the kind of uh, training requirements is, you know, is a positive thing for both the company and for sustainable development because it creates a, you know, a, 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 a high, more highly skilled workforce which have more opportunities then. Is, is that correct? Abs absolutely. Yeah. And um, I mean, one thing what you always need to consider when we, when we talk about Africa, a return on your investment is over a much longer period. So um, mm. the decision in which country you will go and in which country you will invest is very much depending on also the commitment you receive from the other side. And, you know, a stable situation with regards to legislation, a stable situation with regards to the government. Um, these are fundamental um, aspects for us to really make sure that if we go somewhere and two years later you maybe enter in a public-private partnership or whatever, 
um, that you don't lose everything because uh, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. you want to have a sustainable business over a longer period of time and not only for a specific project. And yeah. our technology, uh, luckily or unfortunately, it depends on how you want to see that, uh, does require often service aspects. So we need to make sure that we really can enter into market and then really stay there for a longer period of time. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, just moving on to the second question. So, um, um, excuse me if I pronounce your name wrong, but my name? Um, um, Sabine from Siemens, she, she mentioned sustainability in, I guess, two different ways. One, in terms of sustainable development for the country, but also sustainability for the company. And it'd be interesting just to kind of see what those distinctions might, might mean. Um, in your experience of, of working with companies on sustainable er in the sustainable areas, it, I mean, is sustainability just a buzzword which they use? Or, and and uh, what does it really mean for a business when, when they talk about sustainability? The one million dollar question, is it a buzzword? Hmm. Um, I think the question should be whether they have a choice today or no to apply sustainability. Uh, back in 2008, the global economic crisis, I think we've, all the private sector companies have learned that companies that have made it you know, through the crisis, they were companies that have ranked higher in their sustainability index. And they've learned big time that companies, they cannot function independently or in disconnection from the society. You know? So it was mandatory for companies to, to, to open eye for sustainability today. And I think today there are signs that can say that it's not a buzzword anymore. Sustainability is not a, a side dish. It's a main dish today on the plate. So um, if you look at uh, 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 risk management or risk strategies of companies today, so you will see ESG is a big um, uh, point there. If you look at the number of sustainability reports and, and, and disclosure on ESG uh, factors you know, from companies, it's growing at the rate of 9% globally. In fact, in the Arab world back in 2010, we only had 30 organizations reporting on sustainability. Today, we have 90 and more reporting on sustainability. Um, there is a pressure coming from all sides. For example, Customers today are requesting sustainability. Uh, companies, if they apply for tenders today, they request them to disclose their sustainability factors in order to gain points and credits to, know, to, to, get the, um, to, to win the, uh, the RFP or the tender. Um, uh, countries today are pushing. So if you see, for example, stock markets in the Arab world, in fact, we have six stock markets that have signed for the United Nations Sustainable Exchange Initiative. Uh, which means eventually they'll be requesting and mandating sustainability disclosure and reporting for companies. So companies that don't have a choice today, they have to report, they have to apply sustainability, and uh, governments are signing global commitment for the United uh, Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which means they're gonna cascade all these commitments to the private sector, pushing the private sector to play a bigger role in sustainability and mitigating their long-term risk. It's not a buzzword, it's a reality today, and we have to face it. Oh, I mean, thank you very much. So. Um, what you're saying is that sustainability is not just wishful thinking, it's being driven by the private sector. I mean, do, do you see it as something which companies are implementing um, b because it makes business and, and commercial suc uh, um, success for them, or is it because governments are kind of forcing them to do it? No, definitely there is a big ROI in sustainability. We all, every single day, like in every meeting, you know, we talk about the business case of sustainability. There is a big ROI here. Companies are really seeing, you know, uh, sustainability hitting the, uh, the P&L on the bottom line of organizations. There are a lot of organizations that are making difference and making profit when it comes to investing in sustainability, getting close to community, engaging with different stakeholders, building capacity within the community and youth and aligning with the sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. So, I mean, that brings us on nicely to, to maybe looking at some of uh, the leading uh, governments and or countries attracting foreign direct investment around the world um, and, and look at this from their perspective. So, the third question is to, to, to Robert Herman, the CEO of Germany Trade and Investment. So, um, I mean, Germany, as we know, is a, you know, is a, a world leader in renewable energy. Um, ha has a huge renewable energy industry, and also households have been you know, one of the, the biggest adopters in the world of renewable energies. So clearly at the national level, there's, a, there's been this very strong focus on renewable energy in particular for many, many years. So I, I kind of have two questions. First of all, um, how does the, the national kind of government focus on, on renewable energy feed through to the investment promotion? side of things? Does that mean that as a foreign direct investment strategy, you're also very much focused on attracting sustainable investments? Um, and then Germany attracts a lot of investments. So I was just wondering, in, in the experience of your organization and working with foreign investors, um, are, they, are they still interested 
in financial incentives when they're deciding to invest in Germany or where to invest in Germany as a, as a, as a big federal country. Um, and in your view, do you think that sustainability factors are becoming a part of the site selection process for companies? Sorry, difficult questions. <laughs> um, yeah, with possible very um, extensive answers. Um, let me start with um, the incentive scheme in Germany. So the incentive scheme in Germany is basically focusing on the basic investment promotion incentive scheme. It's focusing on investments. That's it. So, um, and we only have a certain region that needs further economic development, so there is not all Germany, or if you invest in Germany, it's not in every region in Germany where you get incentives. It's basically focusing on the eastern part of Germany, um, and this incentive scheme started in 1999, 1990, I'm sorry, um, mm -hmm. and uh, has been developed in the past years. Um, it's less broad. Um, in the beginning, every investment has been um, uh, financed or sub financially supported through the government. Um, uh, the regions, as they co-finance projects, have nowadays a chance to decide whether they like to finance or co-finance a project. Um, to be honest, uh, they are um, that keen on getting investments. Um, they do still are, um, support um, projects from every um, sector. Um, sustainability in terms of ecological perspectives uh, do, in this regard, not play a tremendous role. Sustainability in terms of long-term perspectives do play a role. Um, in Germany, we don't pay, very interesting to hear from Siemens, um, uh, in Germany, uh, the incentive scheme is based on cash grants um, and not on tax um, holidays. Um, I think uh, that's at least what we learned in the past, um, in the last 20 years. It's much more attractive for the companies because they get the money when they need the money and not eight to ten years after building and construction um, mm -hmm. when they um, have earnings. Because mm -hmm. uh, you only need tax uh, holidays if mm -hmm. you have earnings. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, it, it takes much longer perspective. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in this regard, then, tax holidays would be obviously sustainable. <coughs> Um, on the other hand, because you need to stay in the, in the region to benefit from these tax holidays. Um, uh, the incentives, or so the whole industry sect, um, scheme or arena is very much focusing on energy transition. Um, uh, the German government is very much focusing on renewable energies, on energy efficiency aspects in manufacturing, in industry, as well as in housing and construction. Um, so there is a tremendous amount of opportunities in R&D incentives for everyone, for German companies as well as for companies from outside of Germany. Um, and um, uh, so there is a tremendous focus, and through that focus there is a sustainability focus also for, of the incentive scheme that is not written down somewhere we focus on that topic, it's just part of the nature and the system. Um, in 2014, interesting, um, the German, no, the European Union decided to establish a new system of uh, incentives in Europe um, that's called EPCEI, which is Important Projects for Common Interest, uh, Common European Interest, um, that gives governments in Europe, um, coordinated through Brussels, um, the opportunity to um, intensify um, high, on, on much higher levels um, investments into certain industry segments, um, especially with a focus on industry segments where Europe is not that developed and where Europe needs further investment from abroad. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, the microelectronics um, uh, industry um, uh, is not a very strong industry in Europe, so we have only 6% of the global market share, which is a very small um, segment uh, or uh, market share. Um, and so the European Union decided that this is microelectronics should be um, a, uh, an industry segment that should, be, should benefit from more or incentivized, more incentives. Um, and that's just the f first uh, industry segment that is uh, focused. Um, uh, until um, March uh, 15 this year, there has been gathered a group of experts to discover the next topics for this EPCEI industry segments um, uh, that then is elaborated on a European basis. And um, I, would, uh, I, I would assume, and that's foreseeable, that um, sustainability is going to play a role. Sustainability with regards to risk um, reduction, 
to, um, with regards to sustainability of m value chains and markets and opportunities, as well as on an ecologically basis, um, where it means uh, that how we handle our environment and um, how we deal with um, uh, energy topics like energy efficiency, energy storage, energy um, renewable energies, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. I mean, it's uh, some really interesting comments there. Um, I think re relevant for this discussion, one of the comments was that about sustainability, um, not, no, not just talking meaning about the ecological or social side, but also talking about the, the economic side as well. Um, for example, building strategic industries which maybe are struggling to be developed in, as you say, maybe all of Europe, not even just one country, and that incentives um, can play a role apparently in helping to bring those industries. Would that, is that, I mean, uh, presumably the EU has a policy of these higher levels of incentives because they believe it can make a difference to, to attract any investment. So, I mean, is, is that, I mean, do you, think, do you think that will make a difference to bringing, for example, microelectronics investments? Um, I, I, it has, as has been mentioned this morning from the colleague from the World Bank, um, I would say, especially in Europe, incentives only in the last step do play an important role or can play a role. Mm. Um, if the market is not ready, if uh, the uh, value chain is not there, if R&D opportunities are not existing, the infrastructure is lacking, um, all mm. these questions, if those, th those questions are not positively answered, you don't even answer or need an answer to the question of incentives. Um, uh, in case that is um, the case, then you differentiate bet maybe between nations, the last two nations, three nations or sites, let's say, um, uh, might, might also be within Germany in one side to another side mm. um, where you get incentives or not. Um, in the last step, you decide on incentives or incentives might support your decision. Um, to be honest, um, you have also to, and that's maybe a question to, to you, um, uh, to see the other side of the idea of investing. I would say companies are very often also keen on getting rid of sites in their site selection process um, because you consider um, 10, 15, 20 countries or sites, and you're keen on getting rid of them. So if um, um, uh, some questions are not answered, and incentives are probably the last questions because it's very um, unpredictable as well as un difficult to understand how incentives might be calculated in a, uh, in a business plan, a business case. Um, you can calculate infrastructure, you can calculate logistics, um, uh, personnel costs, um, uh, and other questions. You can't difficult or it, you will have difficulties to calculate uh, incentives, especially if it comes to labor um, incentives. Um, we have that in Germany as well. Um, uh, then it can, becomes much more difficult. So the companies probably will have an, uh, will be very keen on getting rid of the, uh, as many sites as possible. Then and and to work in the end only with two, three, four sites, um, and then focus on those questions because the other, on the other hand it would be by far too um, uh, exhausting for um, getting to the right answers. Oh, thank you very much, that was, that was a really great response, thanks. Um, the fourth question, uh, Alice Long, your Director of uh, Trade and Investment, Department of International Trade in, in this region, um, I know you've worked in, in other regions around the world as well. Um, I mean, the UK has also been at the forefront of, of renewable energy, maybe different sectors to Germany, um, in particular offshore wind, uh, where the UK is the number one country in the world. Um, and now electric vehicles is you know, a fascinating time in the UK, um, with the UK the, the first and only country in the world, as far as I know at least, to, to set a, a target date, I think 2030, um, to end the sales of combustion engine cars, which is going to force, you know, uh, the car industry to adopt electric vehicles and even companies like Dyson which build vacuum cleaners are, uh, you know, have invested billions in building electric cars now and batteries so it's, it's obviously having a big impact. Um, at the same time you know the, the UK is leaving the European Union um, in a couple years um, which may lead to more scope in areas like it, incentives policy which is currently set and, you know, de and determined in terms of the levels by the European Union. So, um, again, a, 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 a few questions, and again, apologies there, maybe not so, such easy questions to answer, uh, is, uh, but um, the first question is really on the um, um, sustainable FDI strategy of, uh, of, of DIT, Department of International Trade. Um, now, is Department of International Trade targeting companies, which will, especially companies which will contribute to sustainable development, or is it still uh, based more on just, you know, bringing jobs and investment, whichever industry they come from. 
Um, and just, just in terms of incentives, you know, what, what's your view um, in how incentives are in, in site selection in determining where companies invest? And you know, if, if incentives are going to be given, do you think they should be more focused on sustainable industries and sustainable companies? Henry, thanks. Um, so to start, I think to say the UK is not a proponent of incentives in general, um, especially those that would create market distortion, either in the UK or, or elsewhere. Um, it's simply not a model we adopt. The approach in the UK has been to create the most favorable uh, investment landscape that we can. And in that, I think we've been incredibly successful. Uh, and, a, and a key part of that is creating a level playing field so that everybody can enjoy the same opportunity uh, and creating uh, the greatest degree of ease of business as possible. So, for example, the UK has a very low taxation, low regulation uh, climate. You, you may know we talk of one in, two out. So for every piece of new uh, regulation we bring in, we try and get rid of two. Um, we speak English, we're in the right time zone. We've got a great legal system. Uh, we've got a fantastic uh, base of research and development. As was mentioned, that's such an important part of the investment um, prospect. Uh, and, and that really is why investors come to the UK, and they are coming to the UK. And we, we had, um, in 2017, our record year for the number of investment projects. Uh, we are increasingly in the Department for International Trade. We've all, always played a part in trying to encourage those projects coming to the UK. But we are increasingly trying to become more sophisticated in uh, the, the way that we assess those projects. So it's not just number, it's not just value, it's not even, as you say, jobs or growth. It, it, it is increasingly about the contribution that they make to the national goals of the UK. Um, there are domestic incentives, certainly, um, for the British population to um, uh, encourage greener, more sustainable behavior. We have um, perhaps not had the record that Germany's had, but we've had a record of um, encouraging people through financial incentive into the use of green technology and so on. Um, but I, w I, I don't think that's been a big part of our investment landscape. Uh, I think the, the more significant contrib uh, contribution to those who look at the UK for green investment is our research and development, which is, I think, second to none, uh, is the commitment of our government. Uh, and you mentioned the policy on uh, electric vehicles, but there are many others that you could highlight too, where the government is so very uh, clear about the future of this for the UK, that as an investor you could be in no doubt. And then the final thing I mentioned is I think that the, the UK is now, if not um, the leading centre in the world for green finance, it, it's certainly up there and that is a massive uh, development in our um, already burgeoning financial services sector that we now offer this, um, uh, this green finance, which is, which is again a, a very big pull for investors. Um, offshore has been a, an amazing story of success and it's one I have to mention here because it's had significant Gulf investment uh, into it and I think you know what our experience of working with Gulf investors is, is that they are increasingly very very sophisticated and they are not just looking for return on investment they're not just looking frankly for a sustainable investment over a long period they're also looking to invest in something that is worthwhile you know, they want to contribute to the greater good, and, and, and um, I think our proposition on offshore has been particularly attractive in that respect. No, well, thank you very much. Um, a really interesting response. Um, again, a, a few, a few question, follow up questions I have on, on that. Um, you, you kind of seem to suggest that the, the incentive, let's say, for investing in the UK is actually not a, a financial cash grant or something, mm. it's, it's more the incentive of going into a really good business environment with all the kind of key assets which a company needs to be successful. Um, I guess that means the UK is not going to be outbidding Germany or EU countries when you leave, so that's probably good news to hear because you would have a, um, much more flexibility in terms of financial incentives, but you, you clearly, I think, you know, indicated that you don't think those are, are, are key factors for, for site selection and for, for investment into the UK. Um, I mean, your comment about um, how the attitude of um, private investors, or I guess sovereign wealth investors as well, is changing, that they are looking to invest in genuine sustainable development projects, even if the return on investment is lower than, say, non-sustainable projects. I mean, how, 
I mean, which is great to hear, and uh, you know, also reflects the, the, the previous uh, comments from the, from the other private sector representatives on the panel. But uh, um, I mean, how, how, how big are we talking about here? I mean, are we, are we talking about most kind of investors moving in that direction? Are we talking about huge investments now kind of going into those kind of green funds or, or green investment opportunities? Do you have any idea on that? Um, so, to, well, perhaps just to start with, I thought what Robert said about uh, the calculation that an investor makes on going into a market being about um, as, as much about the, the investment landscape as any incentive is, is absolutely right and he's also right that they're, they're trying to get rid of potential places as quickly as possible and, and, and narrow them down and I think that's why the UK does very well because we have a very clear framework and very clear answers to most of the questions mm. very quickly. Um, are we going to be outbidding our EU partners? We are, we are very close partners now. We will be very close partners when we leave, I hope. Um, but the truth is we are, we're also already in sharp competition, so I don't think, I don't think frankly, that changes. Mm -hmm. um, on Gulf investment, uh, I think that, you know, as they grow more sophisticated, the requirement on them to be able to articulate publicly what they're about grows. And, and uh, they're not just about the, the trillion held in assets, they're about what those assets are doing for their nationals who increasingly care about things like sustainable development, mm -hmm. uh, future of technology, those sorts of things. Um, I think when you talk about the, the scale of difference, uh, the reality is that most investors will have a portfolio uh, and the portfolio will allow for greater return on investment in some parts of it mm -hmm. and, and greater contribution in other parts of it. And so um, it's, it's not quite the right measure for me. It's yeah. what share of your portfolio is going to be less focused on return on investment. And I think what we're seeing is a diversification of the portfolio. That's really interesting. So I guess if you're looking for green investment, this region is quite an interesting region to look at, trying to raise that kind of fi the financing for the projects. Um, thank you. Um, the fifth question, um, moving on to now a, a leading emerging market in attracting foreign direct investment. Um, Sapa Beck, you're chairman of the board of Kazakh Investment. Um, Kazakhstan obviously is a, a big energy producing country, attracted a, a huge amount of FDI. Um, just generally, I mean, what opportunities do you see for investment in Kazakhstan? Um, and what are the role of incentives in, in helping the economic development of the country? And m moving away from, let's say, the oil and gas sector, which still, of course, needs big investment, but are there other industries you're looking at to diversify um, the economy and, and, and sustainable development? Yes, uh, thank you. Well, first of all, a couple of words about the sustainable <coughs> investment. Of course, the, for many transition and developing countries, the tax ex, uh, incentives is, uh, used to be the, one of the main incentives uh, given, uh, proposed to the investors. But uh, over the time, uh, um, as you know, the uh, technology is changing, the communication is changing. That's why the, the demand uh, by the investors also changed. Even the SME uh, started to invest abroad. And the many, uh, the, not only the big companies, uh, small and medium companies also becoming the more global. That's why the demand for the incentives is changing. Uh, that's why, the, um, as the practice, uh, our practical experience showed, and the many, many studies showed, uh, the more than 80% of investors are looking for the market or the efficiency. So this is the main driving force of the uh, investment. That's why, the, um, of course, uh, over the past uh, 20 years, um, Kazakhstan could attract uh, uh, more than Three hundred billions of dollars, and it's the more than the seventy percent of the investment which is attracted to the whole Central Asia. Uh, among the CIS countries, it's the investment FDA <coughs> per capita is the highest in Kazakhstan, so including to Russia and other countries. So, uh, but the, the problem is, uh, it's the main part of this investment become the was the resource driven. Uh, no, uh, that's why the uh, we changed our approach and. Uh, uh, actually, the attraction of investment incentives becoming more complex because uh, the time is changing, the demand is changing. That's why uh, uh, we've, over the past few years, worked in different directions. First of all, we have to create the market. Kazakhstan internal market is very small for the many investors. That's why we worked on hard, uh, actual the erosion integration, uh, erosion economic union was the initiative of our uh, government. 
So this uh, now Kazakhstan is a part of the uh, big market uh, with uh, the population of more than 180 million of population. On top of this, uh, also we were very supportive always the in economic integration in Central Asia, which is uh, over the past year becoming uh, more uh, progressive and uh, uh, the economically uh, many countries is becoming together, uh, creating a single market. <coughs> On top of this, uh, the, the Chinese initi uh, government of, uh, initiative of the government of China, the One Road, One Bill, actually was initiated. Many people don't know about this uh, in Kazakhstan five years ago. It was also very supported by our government because uh, it um, creates uh, more uh, access to the to the new markets. So no transportation of the uh, container transportation starting from the eastern China to the western Europe is already become true. And uh, over the past few years, the, it's growing each year the two, three times. So uh, this creates uh, new markets in, in, in China for Kazakhstan. So if you compare the Western China with the population of more than 300 people, uh, the, uh, population uh, uh, sup supplying from uh, East Coast is uh, more than 4,000 kilometers. From Kazakhstan, it's uh, 700 kilometers. So it's uh, naturally becoming the more attractive uh, to supplying to these markets. That's why uh, uh, this, uh, we could create a more broader market and access to this market. On top of this internal issue, the uh, safety of the investment and the guarantee of the private property. Uh, we've changed the law. We, we, together with the OECD over the five, uh, past five years, uh, which we make the huge reform. And the last year, Kazakhstan was the first and the single country accepted to the Committee of Investment of OECD. Uh, this is also a, a good indicator for the many, many foreign <coughs> investors. Uh, um, and the additionally, uh, this year we've uh, opened and established the Astana Financial Center, uh, International Financial Center, it, uh, and we've got the model of the Dubai Financial International Center, and also we established the uh, um, made the amendment in constitution and established an independent uh, court, system, court system, English law court system. So it's already the other uh, uh, judges are appointed. So on the 5th of July, we'll have a present, big presentation in Astana. So investors can apply either the traditional law court system or the new court system. It's totally, absolutely independent. So this is also the um, will of the government to create inside Kazakhstan more safe place to invest for the foreign investors. Those are the main initiatives. And uh, <clears throat> of course, now we see the uh, huge interest uh, in oil and gas downstream, petrochemicals, metallurgy, and also the, the, the main important sector is uh, agriculture and the food industry, because we have to supply the, with, to this huge market, which is available right now. Mm -hmm. So those are the main initiatives. and. Uh, 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 we also in the future believe that the, the main driving force will be the skilled labor forces. This is what, uh, this is the main our strategy in FTA strategy. Uh, for this, uh, that's why the next, uh, uh, we, we call it the more potential, uh, most potential uh, sectors for the FTA is uh, information technologies and uh, it's tourism and the financial uh, sector. Those are the uh, future sectors that uh, we are expecting the investment. So uh, we see the diversification, we see the interest, and that's why we uh, started to present Kazakh uh, Kazakhstan differently, and uh, we uh, get uh, perceive it differently. No, thank you very much. I mean, there seems to be a lot happening, <laughs> a lot of uh, you know, really major policy changes taking place which will encourage foreign direct investment. Um, I think your, your, uh, your uh, comments will feed very nicely to the next speaker, but before we, before we move on, um, you mentioned some new industries you're trying to promote, like, like the food industry or agribusiness industry, um, given that you have a, not a, a domestic market, but a huge regional market which you, ha you can provide the, the food for. Um, do, do you think there's opportunity for Kazakhstan to attract more sustainable agricultural and food companies? I mean, do you have, do you have any, any, any views on that yet? Well, this is the main requirement, actually. 
That's why uh, <clears throat> it's not uh, just agriculture with the real high technology. Why? Because we believe that the, uh, the main source of the agriculture and the food industry is the land. So without the technology, we can lose easily the land and the potential of this land. That's why uh, when we are uh, negotiating, we are attracting the main concern, main requirement is uh, with sustainable technology, mm -hmm. green technology. That's why uh, we already got uh, some investors from European countries and uh, with, uh, from, the, from the United States and uh, with Arab countries. Uh, uh, and uh, um, the restrictions are uh, perceived uh, normally because there is no problem because uh, this is the, our main resource in this sector. Mm -hmm. um, and also the green technology. Uh, actually, <coughs> to, to compare with the other sectors, we have more financial incentives in this sector too. Okay. Uh, cheap uh, loans inside Kazakhstan and uh, uh, agricultural subsidies and the infrastructure and the training the labor forces. So uh, we believe that it, it, it's, um, it should be mm -hmm. sustainable. And so, no, really good that you mentioned that the, your incentives policy is also focusing on those more sustainable sectors for, for the future of the country. Um, you, you also mentioned that, you know, a key part of the government strategy to attract more investment and, and development is, is you know, regional integration, um, forming tr trade agreements across the region, integrating more closely with a huge Chinese market. Um, so, I mean, the next speaker, Mr. Yonov, you're Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization. So obviously have a, a lot of expertise in the trade area. Um, and in terms of um, foreign direct investment, so clearly market size, and I think we'll all agree, uh, as mentioned, um, is a key driver globally in terms of foreign investment. From, from a WTO perspective, you know, are financial incentives also important in determining where foreign direct investment go? Or is it, is, it, is it trade agreements and market size which is the key driver? Um, and this, the second question, if you look at a lot of foreign investment, especially in emerging markets and developing countries, it's going to you know, free zones where you know, there's big tax advantages, often no tax, customs adva duties advantages and so on. Um, do you think it's possible or, or should governments and, and free zones link the uh, tax benefits they give companies to, to attracting more sustainable type investments? So that's the, the, the two questions I had. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Henry. Uh, your questions raise both uh, empirical and conceptual issues. First, I would like to say that the evidence, both in the literature and in research by the WTO, the World Bank, uh, OECD, UNCTAD, shows that there is no linkage between fiscal and financial incentives to the ability of countries to attract uh, and retain investments. I think uh, from what, ha what you had in the opening plenary yesterday, it's obvious that the critical elements for these are things like ease of doing business, uh, the business environment, the economic uh, fundamentals, which are necessary to attract investment. So from our perspective, there's no one size fits all. Each country based on its economic, political, geographical situation can now evolve policies as to how best to attract investment. In terms of whether you do this within your customs territory or you put in place a free zone, that again is a matter for the host economy. From a WTO perspective, we have no rules with respect to free zones per se. However, because of the taxes for gone in free zones and the adverse impact that these policies can have on trade flows, the, there are requirements. If you look at the WTO agreement on, subsi on subsidies and countervailing measures, subsidies are prohibited except 
for a few group of countries which are low income. And even for these countries, if a member feels that your measures are distorting trade and impacting negatively on its trade interests, it can still take you to dispute settlement. And that re relates directly to trading goods. In terms of uh, investment and trading services, where you alter your national requirements or your requirements in favor of your countries or nationals, that could also be a problem. And I think, so what we are trying to say here is that when a member or a country is trying to design its incentive packages, it needs to take into consideration the requirements, who qualifies to benefit, the, whether it is export dependent or whether you are requiring some do, use of domestic resources like uh, local content requirements. All these will come into play as to whether uh, you would be subject to dispute settlement by other members. Outside that, like I said, we have no one-size-fits-all approach. All members are free to design their policies in terms of their development needs, their development objectives and capacity. But once you don't take into account these factors as to export perform performance and uh, preference to your domestic uh, industries, then you have a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very interesting. <laughs> um, so on the one hand, you, you say all the evidence suggests that incentives do not make much impact on where <coughs> companies invest. But, uh, but at the same time, we see governments around the world giving a lot of incentives for companies to, to attract them. So wh wh where do you think this now that this comes from, this paradox? Well, I think, let's be honest. If investments are going to where profits are going to be made, you could even see investors going into war situations. Depending on the, what do you call it, orientation to risk aversion. So why you think some, why some, some, some investors will think Africa is not good for stability, inst political instability, Others are still going there and investing and getting money. Sometimes the resource endowments can attract investors, depending on who wants to do what. So in terms of giving out financial incentives, I'm simply saying the evidence does not support that the country with the highest amount of tax uh, waivers or import duty waivers will get the best uh, kind of uh, investments without taking into account the cost of doing business, the cost of trade, the connectivity and level of infrastructure, good governance, and those things that provide predictability and transparency to your regulatory regimes. So these are more important, mm. I would want to think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, maybe come back to, back to that in a few minutes. Um, just going to our final panelists, and apologies for putting you last on, the, on, a, on a big panel. Um, Bos Jan, you're CEO of Wiper, World Association of Investment Promotion Agencies. And, and you also were you know, CEO of a, of a the Slovenian IPA previously, so a lot of experience in this area. I mean, uh, you, know, you work with IPAs all around the world. Um, you see what they're doing, you're training them, working with them. Um, and I, I, I remember reading a, a Wiper survey of, of, your, of uh, your members of IPAs a few years ago now. Um, and it was looking at you know, whether they, they are looking at sustainable development as a criteria when looking at what kind of companies to attract. And it was relatively low down in terms of the ranking. They were still very much focused just on job creation uh, and investment and exports, wh whatever, whatever type of companies and type of industries that was the priority. Um, is that changing, I just wonder, from, from, from your experience working with IPAs? Are, are they, and, and this whole conference on sustainable development, so the fact we have lots of IPAs here may, may indicate, but I, I just wonder from your, your experience, and in reality, you know, is it changing? And in, in terms of your organization, I mean, do you have, I mean, do you have any um, views uh, or perspectives like the WTO on the, on the uh, importance of giving incentives, you know, IPAs I'm, I'm sure are asking you whether you should get, they should give incentives, what type of incentives, I mean, what do you think from your experience um, on how, how relevant they are? 
to be honest, if you listen now the panelists, so we have three of our members here in the panel. I mentioned before just the Kazakh members, but there is also the German one and the UK. Uh, I guess from all of their uh, speech was clearly seen that they put attention. Maybe it's not uh, institu institutionalized yet enough, but they are definitely putting it. And in the recent survey, very short survey we did, it comes to the third place after, after let's say, after care and uh, new types of FDI. Yeah. It's one of the most important topics. Uh, two years ago, I would answer in this manner that even the countries that signed an agreement in 2015 are not really aware what they signed. Uh, but now, what, what we are seeing, also speaking with uh, some ministers, uh, that they are more and more aware that there is a time, and time is here and now, and we should act. And uh, accordingly, of course, the IPAs who report directly to prime ministers or to presidents, who are the top authorities which decides about the strategies, that one has a, b a bit bigger advantage, I would say, because they immediately get the instructions to put into their policies and to their strategies the SDG uh, let's say, perspective. I can say, I can share a couple of, let's say, good practices, and I guess the, Sabine would also agree since she comes from South Africa. There is a, a good project that they did, for example, our member uh, in West South Africa did something in the wind energy. Uh, um, it's under the some governmental renewal by energy independent power producer program, so they made some kind of attraction that even the windmills are produced in South Africa. It's even uh, less footprint done there. And uh, another one is in invest in India, doing something together with Vestas, also putting attention like this Moody's 24 times 24 seven power for all. So it looks like that they are putting these things into their policies and uh, they are doing the best possible. And uh, I, I would say that um, any kind of investment can be viable uh, as, a, let's say, sustainable. But uh, my predecessor said uh, that uh, it's not one size fits all. So it means some of them are uh, facing much, much bigger problems than the others. And then, of course, these incentives come uh, that the investors are just using them. Uh, they come to the region and then they know, actually, where they would go, so they just play into these incentives. <laughs> so we are trying to tell to, to our uh, members uh, not to focus on to in, into investments, of course. Uh, they should focus on the other things like legal framework and uh, things, but of course they should have in mind long-term projects, as was what's also mentioned before. So it means that they should look at the investments that will bring uh, some sort of uh, long-term benefits, and uh, I guess that's, that's the recommendation. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. I mean, because, I mean, also there's, you know, there's companies like Siemens and the other companies we, we um, have heard about, um, organizations which are, are looking for green type investments, looking to be more sustainable in the economy. So there's plenty of companies out there which you could be speaking to as an IPA, which are likely to have a, a, be, a be, better impact in terms of sustainable development. In terms of incentives, I mean, what's the, what's the wiper perspective on, on incentives? Uh, actually, the generally, if you look only in the incentives, we would say this is not the, the first priority. This should be the cherry on the cake at the end. As I'm saying, so, of course, there are some IPAs are telling us we do not have a proper business environment. We do not have proper legislational framework. So we are fighting with the incentives. We are simply giving incentives. Okay, if they have a strategies that uh, they promote, uh, you know, we have different type of uh, investments resource seeking, uh, I don't know, efficiency seeking. So the ones who are mostly giving their resources, of course, they are many times competing only with uh, some in incentives. But the ones who has already the established business environment, then of course they are putting uh, attention to different things. And also investors know very well that they cannot play with them there. And then of course, maybe at the end, by the final decision, they are getting uh, some incentives. Everyone would uh, would wish course, to get yeah. some incentive, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, yes. uh, so, but the recommendation is not to focus on the incentives, but to focus on the preparing the proper environment, stable environment, politically, economically stable environment, uh, uh, good policies, which will somehow embed this sustainability into, into the, let's say, future plans, prioritization of sectors, 
the sectors that they can really uh, offer to the investors to invest in, uh, and then incentives would come at the end. Okay, th thank you very much. Um, no, that's re really useful, thank you. I mean, I think we've uh, reached our hour, uh, we started a bit late, so let me just give a, an opportunity if anybody in the audience has any, qu has any questions for the panelists. Um, maybe the person at the, back, the lady at the back there. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm Karen Lagner from uh, the Costa Rica Investment Promotion Agency. We wanted to get uh, the perspective of the panelists, uh, particularly those from the private sector, on how you have two flavors of sustainable development, right? So the green investments in clean technologies or structure or infrastructure projects that are uh, not developed yet in certain regions. We have seen opportunities uh, in Africa in that sense. And then on the other hand, you have uh, countries that are very much aligned already uh, with SGDs. Um, so uh, what would be the, the driver, if any, uh, for companies to invest? Is it more towards the infrastructure projects or is it, is it weighing in on countries that are already sustainable? And if so, sorry, because it's a twofold question here. If so, what would be those KPIs for sustainability that impact that bottom line that you were saying uh, as to performance? Uh, is it a driver for, for investment? How, how that impacts countries, for example, choosing Sweden or Norway, or in our case, which are very much aligned uh, with sustainable goals as well. Is it a driver and how much so? So which are the two flavors uh, if you were to pick or, or what is the tendency there on sustainable uh, investment. Thank you. Uh, would you want to maybe... Um, no. um, there is a study that was published by Business and Sustainable Development Commission back in Davis uh, in 2016, and it has sized up the market, the potential opportunities to be investing in sustainable development goals. It's about $12 trillion in uh, sectors like um, food, agribusiness, cities, and energy. And if you want to mention something around the KPIs, all these, um, if I can mention, for example, the um, health and well-being industry alone will create about 380 million jobs by 2030. So KPIs should focus on job creation. We should focus on how much value we are creating in the local economy. Should focus how much we are empowering the women around these projects should focus how much we are driving social inclusion around these projects. So investors are looking for the ROI, yes, but they're setting up these kind of KPIs that are, um, I call them the genuine KPIs, the non-financial performance of investments. Thank you. Um, well, you maybe, maybe from, a, from a business point of view, I think there's quite a big difference between markets which are not developed, and I think the time has changed quite significantly. So if you would have asked this question five years ago, you would have got a different answer. Um, and, and one for the reasons is, for instance, when we invest in countries where we are already there, then an investment into additional facility comes exactly to the point. You want to reduce the number of locations because you want to get a higher productivity, a higher unit number, a higher level of automation, a higher level of, of digitalization to get a better product out to the market market which you can have in, in higher variances at the market. So that is, that is one aspect because there are a lot of products where you need a number of units which you have to sell into the market and that you only can get in concentrated areas. When we look specifically into markets and here specifically on Africa, um, when you look into markets which are currently not developed, so why do we look at it? Because actually it's quite a big job for a company like ours to invest in these markets, yeah? Because right now, I mean, we talk about a lot of Africa, but fact is that not really a lot of people are dealing with Africa in, in an extent that they're really buy finished products from Africa. Yeah, we buy commodities which we basically export as a raw commodity and it actually doesn't matter how long it takes until the goods get to the harbor because it's, it's a kind of iron ore or some kind of a resource. Um, and we then ask them to buy back finished products which I get from somewhere else with a price tag. So in order really for us to make that kind of investment also viable, specifically if we talk about transportation, that requires like companies and like agencies like the German Trade and Invest, which assist us uh, and the GIZ to develop the studies of will we be able to have a pipeline 
um, a rail connection, a harbor, which has the relevant utilization to make it actually a commercial viable proposition. Because none of us have the money laying on a bank account just waiting to invest somewhere. So whatever we do, we need to have a market-related return. So at the end of the day, somebody has to pay the interest. Um, it can be lower and higher, that, that variance. But nevertheless, it needs to be a commercial proposition because otherwise, as a company, we are not able to invest in this kind of projects because then we basically don't look after the interests of our shareholders. And as I said in the beginning, we are not a charity, so we're not the Red Cross. We have to invest for the purpose of making business at the end of the day. And the benefit we see right now, specifically out of the discussion we had in Germany on the migration matter, is very much around that we say the German government now has understood we need to invest into Africa and that needs to be more than just, you know, humanitarian aid, um, because that doesn't really help the Africans. Really helping um, African countries to develop the infrastructure, the Compact on Africa initiative, which the German government has put forward, exactly focuses on these aspects where we talk about how can we actually generate, and I look to your uh, points, how can we generate a society and an environment where investing is easy, like you would go into Germany or into the UK, but rather making it complicated. And I think these, these matters are, are very important for an investment decision. And at the end of the day, you need to have paying customers, because when you look into many of the African countries, unfortunately, people live under one US dollar a day. Yeah? So if I have a kilowatt hour of electricity, which cost me 70 US dollar cents, the last thing I will do is buy a kilowatt hour of electricity. I will try to find something where I can feed my family. And I think these dimensions we, we keep to, uh, need to keep in mind and help also the African markets to create uh, commercial markets where they can trade with Europe and be relevant for the global market. Do you want to make a, a comment? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I mean, as representatives of the investment community, I wanted to add something on the policy perspective. Because the SDGs, for example, identify trade, investment, and technology as the key enabling uh, for enablers for implementation. And the UNDP, which is charged with this implementation, is looking at mainstreaming the SDGs in national development strategies. And I think this is something you will need to take up with your governments. In doing that, you need to see how you can bring in the, element, the, the sustainable elements of investment, of the social factor, the economic, the environmental, and the governance issues all into what you discuss at the national level. I would also, coming from the WTO, wish to let you know that a group of members have started a discussion on investment facilitation for development. This approach is not to do away with national investment policies, but to provide better transparency, better coordination, stakeholder consultation mechanisms, and sharing of information. And I think these are things that you may need to talk amongst yourselves with your governments and ministries responsible for WTO in your countries to ensure that whatever you discuss here gets translated into policy at the national level. Thank you very much. So um, any other final comments? Everyone's good? Okay. So, I mean, thank you very much to, to our panelists for their you know, amazing contribution. Thanks, everyone, for, for being here today. Uh, maybe give a round of applause to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you.